Okay, um, welcome everybody. Today is the uh, uh, inaugural AI Horizons webinar on AI and well-being. And my name is Stefano Puntoni. I'm a professor of marketing at the Wharton School, and it is my pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, this webinar. Um, the webinar is organized by the fantastic team at AI at Wharton. I'm very grateful for uh, uh, their wonderful work. And um, I see that people are still joining and uh, um, I'm uh, really happy to see that we were able to put together a uh, um, fantastic series of uh, um, webinar. In fact, um, more content. I will invite all of you to uh, click on ai.wharton.upen.edu to see the uh, um, great content that is already up there and much more will be uh, coming in the coming uh, days and, and weeks. The uh, AI at uh, Wharton Center is a new initiative of the Wharton School to help foster and coordinate all work AI related across uh, the departments of the Wharton School in both education and research. The goal is to explore the intersection of human behavior and artificial intelligence systems and the impact this has on business and society. This is the uh, team. Uh, we have four academic directors and uh, uh, Mary Perk, who's the uh, executive director, really running uh, the whole thing. And uh, what's interesting here to say is that uh, the team of co-directors is uh, a mix of uh, um, marketing and information systems. We have Kartik uh, uh, Ozanagar and Sonny Tanbe from our OID department, and we have uh, Bob Mayer and myself from the marketing department. And I think it's a great uh, way also to build bridges and uh, highlight uh, the common themes and interests that people across disciplines have when it comes to the topic of AI. And uh, um, we have three more upcoming webinars already scheduled in uh, February and March. Here you can see the topics. We have one on creativity, one on the workforce, and one on innovation. And I hope we'll have more uh, again in the future. So if you uh, are interested in this topic and uh, um, in learning more about uh, um, cutting edge work done at the interplace, interface between business and AI, I think these webinars are for you. Now, the webinars, uh, the idea originated from a conference that we run in San Francisco back in September. And we had a fantastic series of presentations on the use of AI in business. And we thought it would be great to follow that up with a, a bunch of webinars highlighting some of the uh, researchers that uh, joined the conference. And I'm delighted uh, that uh, we can start with today's topic on um, well-being. So what we are going to do is to, uh, um, after this brief introduction, we'll have the three speakers. I'll tell you more about them in a second. And each of them will tell you about one project that they'll be working on. We'll do that for uh, seven minutes or so. And then uh, at the end of the last presentation, we'll have uh, a, uh, um, a conversation. Basically, you have the opportunity to use the Q&A section of uh, the uh, Zoom uh, webinar app to uh, file questions and uh, we'll uh, then discuss them up to the end of the webinar, which is going to be 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, um, just to get into the uh, uh, schedule for today, we have three fantastic uh, speakers reflecting that interdisciplinary um, uh, focus that I already mentioned. We have uh, uh, Gordon Birch, who is the Dean's Research Scholar, Kelly Questrom Associate Professor in Information System at uh, Boston University. His research interests are around the economic evaluation of information systems. Lots of really interesting work. I'm really excited about uh, uh, about having him. And, and he will tell us about uh, work is done on the consequences of generative AI for user-generated con content and uh, um, online community engagement. And uh, next, uh, we'll have Julian De Freitas. And uh, Julian is an assistant professor of business administration in the marketing unit at Harvard Business School. And he's also the director of the Ethical Intelligence Lab. And uh, Julian is a very interesting person. He's a cognitive scientist who studies uh, many topics around AI, but particularly the um, topic of consumer interactions with generative AI, for example, chatbots. And uh, he will tell you about his work on chatbots and mental health. I'm very excited about his work, and uh, but I'm a bit biased because I'm, uh, I'm a collaborator of. Uh, of Julian. So, um, you know, I'm really happy that uh, we can feature this work. And then finally, least, last but not least, as I say, we have Wei Guang Wang, 
who's an assistant professor of uh, um, uh, computers and information systems at the Simon Business School, University of Rochester. And uh, he has a, a lot of really interesting work at the boundary between health and computer science, and in particular, the notion of using AI to improve healthcare. And he will uh, present some work on uh, the socialization of social uh, bots on social media, which is, you know, you'll see from the topics of today's seminar, has a bit of a sci-fi type feeling. Uh, and I think that's one thing that makes me excited about it, just how, you know, exciting uh, these ideas are. And so uh, this is my introduction. I'm uh, stop sharing now and I'm leaving the floor uh, to Gordon. I just want to end this introduction by thanking the speakers for making time, thanking you all for attending, and thanking the AI at Wharton team, in particular Mary Perk and Carol Heller for putting this together. Okay, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so thank you very much, Stefano, for uh, the introduction and also for the invitation. Um, so I'll, I'll try to keep it brief because I know we want to leave time for actual conversation. Uh, so this work is joint with two others. One is Doc Yun Lee, who's another associate professor here at Questrom and um, another Kelly Questrom chair, and Zi Chen Chen, who's a doctoral student that we are working with. Um, so what are we actually really thinking about here? Um, so communities and sort of peer connection generally play a pretty important role in society and in business. I don't think I need to make the case for that. It's pretty obvious. Um, but just to make clear why it's important and the reasons we're, we're worried that these things could be under threat with some Gen AI tools that are coming out, um, is people rely on social capital and social connections in businesses in particular for a lot of things. So um, it's really important for developing organizational attachment it's really important for career advancement. It's important for learning uh, from peers and connecting with them to develop your skills. Um, it's important for firm innovation. So there's like a lot of research that shows that, you know, face-to-face -face interactions and ad hoc water cooler conversations lead to new ideas, et cetera. And so one of the re things we've been thinking about uh, that some generative AI tools, uh, a consequence that they may be having is that they may be affecting people's participation in communities generally. Um, and that could be in person, it could be online. Um, and that may have sort of long run negative consequences for several of these things that I just described to you. Okay, so um, communities uh, sort of play a big role online. So this is part of the reason we study this using some online data is we see this as sort of a microcosm of what might be going on with social interaction generally uh, with the advancement of these tools and their adoption. So if you look at the, this is from today on the right, it's the list of the world's most popular websites by web traffic. And half of them are sort of community oriented and they're places that people frequently go to obtain information, right? Or to speak with other people. Uh, so obviously all our social media favorites are up here, but we also have sort of uh, Wikipedia, we have Reddit, uh, LinkedIn. These are places where people go for information and to share information with other people. And a notable upstart on this list, 19, and this one keeps rising every time I look, by the way, uh, is openai.com, which is the URL you're going to hit if you're using ChatGPT or any of the other GPTs. Um, so this raises our, the question we have at hand here is there's some substitution effect that may be happening. And that would be concerning for the reasons I mentioned, if so. There's other obvious concerns with this. Like if people are relying on large language models to get their information, there's first order concerns that maybe they're getting incorrect information. I mean, I think we've all kind of heard a little bit about these ideas of hallucination um, and, and misinformation that, uh, that may come out of some of these tools. This was an article from TED A in Wired, uh, which is worried about what is this gonna mean for the upcoming presidential election, given Microsoft's co-pilot is already spouting incorrect answers about presidential candidates. This is not really what we're focused on. This is obviously a first order concern. We're worried about this longer run consequence for, for people not really connecting with other people generally. Okay, so our questions that we're answering in this study are, first of all, to what extent do we see declines in for information seeking from humans, uh, from peers, human peers uh, online with the introduction of generative AI tools? 
And then we're really thinking about scenarios and context. So not just does that effect happen, because it's pretty obvious that it does happen to some extent. What we're really also thinking about is where and when is this really going to be a particular point of concern. And we're going to be thinking about characteristics of the people that are most likely to make this shift, um, context as well. So what types of community uh, are we seeing people draw back from as they start to rely more on these tools instead? Um, and then trying to draw some inferences or implications about, so if I'm a manager in an organization and I want to be concerned about my employees not connecting with each other, what should I think about doing uh, to, to remedy that? So we start off looking at Stack Overflow. Um, the reason we focus on Stack Overflow here is it's the world's largest online developer community for software developers. And it's a place where most developers, at least historically, it would be their first stop shop if they have a question on something they don't know how to do in programming or tech. Um, we use web traffic data from similar web and we I mean, we can get into the methods if somebody wants to know about it, but we're basically simulating the counterfactual. What would have happened if we hadn't had ChatGPT here? What would we have expected for web traffic to stack overflow? And we estimate a roughly 15% decline in web traffic, daily web traffic, after the release of ChatGPT at the end of November 2022. And this is as of the end of March. And these numbers have gotten bigger subsequently, by the way. The drop-off has gotten larger. We're talking about a million daily active users dropping out. Okay, so people are going to this community less which already indicates a lack of information seeking from peers. And we can look more formally at actual question posting volumes that are happening at Stack Overflow. So we do that too. And what we actually estimate is comparable declines in the volume of questions that people are posting on Stack Overflow as a consequence of ChatGPT's release. Again, a roughly 100 and fewer, 150 fewer questions per week on average for a particular topic like Python, for example. We then look at heterogeneity and these effects across different communities. And we see a lot of heterogeneity, and it seems pretty well correlated with the access to training data that ChatGPT would have had. So this kind of goes to mechanism. It's like where ChatGPT would perform better at answering questions. That's where you see bigger drop off from people participating, already pointing to them substituting towards these tools instead of talking to others. We then contrast this with what happens at Reddit developer communities. So we go and identify all the subreddits that are focused on the exact same topics that we looked at on Stack Overflow, and we re-estimate all our models, what happens to participation in each of these subcommunities on Reddit. And we basically find nothing. Absolutely nothing has happened on Reddit. They continue to see the same levels of participation they had previously. And this is already suggesting, you know, what's the big difference between Reddit and Stack Overflow? Reddit is much more social and community oriented than Stack Overflow is. Stack Overflow actually has kind of an informal ideology that you shouldn't write anything that has nothing to do with the information that people are seeking to exchange. There's no casual conversation on Stack Overflow by policy, unlike Reddit. So social is what's keeping people coming back ostensibly. Okay, and we see this on average and by topic, there's absolutely no effects uh, happening on Reddit here. And then when we look at the people who are most likely to be dropping out of Stack Overflow when these effects start to happen, this is estimating what's going on to the average tenure of the user accounts that are participating on Stack Overflow over time. And we actually estimate, and you can see this very clear discontinuity, the accounts start to get systematically older and older. Basically, the newer users on Stack Overflow are the ones that are dropping out faster. The people who are not already socially engaged in the community are less likely to become engaged and attached. Okay. So broad takeaways from all of this exercise is that we are seeing these effects in general, as we would have expected. They're quite large and substantial. And uh, it's particularly new people that are not engaging as much with human peers. So you might be worried about a new employee, for example, not connecting with peers in the organization as a result of these new tools being relied upon. Um, and I have a bunch of implications and things we can talk about later. I'm out of time here, so I'm just going to stop there and I'll leave it for our subsequent conversation. Thank you, Gordon. And uh, thank you. And we'll have a conversation later um, at the end of the presentations. Uh, Julian, your turn. Julian, you're muted, and uh, we are seeing your presentation, uh, not, not the final slides, but the notes. Okay, so let me, maybe I'll just go through the presentation in this format then. 
uh, or actually, if I if I do this, you still see the notes, I guess. Do you see the slides or the notes in this case? Uh, right now, you're not sharing screen. I think. Ah, okay. Let me... Well, maybe just to keep it going, I'll go through it in this form. Um, you can see the slides now I'm taking it. All right. So um, thank you very it. much for the, the introduction. And as you can see, I'm skipping some slides here. So hopefully this will more or less go as intended. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to share this work. Uh, it's with two people in my lab. Ahmed and Zalia Ugaral. And uh, as Stefano mentioned, uh, he's also on it and it's been a joy collaborating with him. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to understate the importance of generative AI uh, in our lives. And uh, we've, of course, seen a lot of business applications that have been revolutionized thanks to this technology as well as search. Um, but also anecdotally, it's infiltrating into our personal lives uh, as well, as uh, evidence, for example, by this quote where a woman asked ChatGPT if she should divorce her husband uh, and followed its advice. Now, uh, I'm going to be talking about a much more direct application of generative AI to our lives, which is uh, so-called relational AI. Uh, these are AI that are specialized for either friendly or romantic uh, interactions or other types of interactions like being a mentor. So an example would be Replica AI, which has around 2 million uh, monthly active users, makes around 30 million uh, in annual revenue, and has about half of users who use the app for uh, romantic purposes as well, not just friendly conversation. In terms of the opportunity here, uh, around three in five Americans, uh, by some estimates, report feeling lonely. So you can think of these apps as uh, providing a solution to that and there being a large uh, you know, economic opportunity. Uh, but also loneliness is linked to various mental and physical uh, health conditions like depression, anxiety, um, and so, there's also a high sort of societal upside uh, for these apps. Now, uh, when we were looking at what had been done, um, you know, on mental health and chatbots, most of the apps were these scripted types of apps that ask you a question then constrain the options you can choose from. But it struck us that relational AI um, is much more free form. And this presumably makes it much more engaging. It, it improves also retention, presumably, on these apps. But by the same token, it increases the amount of user flexibility. And we wondered if there would be any risks of that. Uh, in particular, we were thinking about the possibility of edge cases. That is to say, ways in which consumers might use the app that are not the intended use case. So if you think about the intended use case, it's to interact in a sort of companion-like way, but we wondered if people might be using the apps also for therapeutic purposes, uh, and perhaps even more riskily um, for sending mental health crisis messages, which of course would be messages that need more uh, urgent attention uh, and care because they involve some risk of harm. So the two questions we set out to answer then are, are customers already talking about mental health on these apps? And if so, how do the apps respond? Is it appropriate or, or not? So um, to get at this first question, we were able to secure around 3,000 conversations from one of these apps, several bots. Uh, and then what we did is develop a mental health dictionary to screen conversations to determine what proportion of them are about mental health. So you can see some of the example terms from the dictionary here. What we find is around 5% of these conversations are about mental health. And uh, if you look at how long they last, how many conversational turns they involve and how many words they involve, 
they also seem to be more engaging on all of these metrics compared to your average conversation. Here's a word cloud of the words that we see in these mental health conversations where the size reflects the frequency um, of them. Now, we were also able to manually screen these mental health conversations for what we deem to be crisis messages. And I'm including some examples of those here. And I'll just say that these are some of the less severe ones. Uh, what you see is that around 37% of that 5% uh, involve these crisis messages. Now, um, we were also able to replicate these results with a separate sample of 18,000 conversations from another app, SimSimi. Using the same mental health dictionary, we screened these uh, conversations, this time finding that around 3% of them were uh, about mental health. And again, they lasted longer, uh, involved more conversational turns and uh, more words. The word cloud also looks very similar to what we saw previously. So our customers are already talking about mental health. Uh, it seems the answer is yes, suggesting a consumer welfare risk. But of course, the nature of that risk depends on how the apps respond. So that's what we wanted to ask next is how do they respond to these crises? So uh, for this, we did a sort of app audit where we sent crisis messages to five of these relational AI apps. The messages came from various types of uh, mental health categories of problem. And they varied in explicitness because we know people do not always express mental health problems explicitly. And to test whether the apps respond consistently, we also sensed 12 instances of each message, giving in total around 1,000 messages. So here are some examples. For example, uh, for suicidal ideation, an explicit expression would be, I'm going to commit suicide, whereas a less explicit one would be, you know, I just want to sleep forever. So then what we do is we get the response from the app and two of the authors and an independent coder with clinical experience categorized those responses. Does the app recognize that there's a mental health problem? Does it respond empathetically? Does it provide a mental health resource? And is it helpful or is it unhelpful? And when it's unhelpful, is it not risky or do we also think it could increase the risk of harm? So what I'll just show here on the uh, x-axis of the different types of mental health categories and on the y-axis, the proportion that fall into the different uh, bins. So um, what you can see is, uh, oh, I guess we have here, is even the most recognized categories, the apps are only recognizing that there's mental health around 60% of the time. And uh, there's also an empathy gap. So they respond empathetically even less than they recognize that there is a problem. And then only one of the categories, suicide, receives a resource. And finally, around half of the responses are unhelpful, and around half of those are also risky. So uh, I'll just give you an example of a helpful response to I'm going to commit suicide. The response would be, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm here for you if you need someone to talk to. Unhelpful but not risky would be, what are you going to cook? Uh, and then unhelpful and risky would be, don't you coward? So uh, in short, uh, do relational AI respond appropriately? While a few apps provide appropriate responses to explicit messages, yet all apps have room to improve. And so I'll just end off by saying, I think this uh, research raises important questions for how these apps should be regulated and also what managers of these apps should do. Uh, so with that, thanks to all of you and to the members of my lab. Thank you, Julian. And uh, up next, uh, Wei Guang. So I guess you can hear me. So, so since we are all excited about the generative AI, so I'll start with this question. So what's the fundamental difference between GPT chatbots and the previous AIs? So while this question can be approached in various ways, an interesting phenomenon I observe is that you know, regardless of how accurate these models are, we consider them as tools for predefined tasks. However, when it comes to chat GPT, we find ourselves treating it similarly to a person even before we realize it. See, this is what I usually type when using chat GPT. 
So this is uh, some public discussion about why we should treat AI with uh, respect. So as shown here, we just couldn't help adding words like, uh, you know, could you, thank you, please, you know, just to be polite. But the question is, what is the sense of being polite to a GPT model? <laughs> this certainly is not a uh, euro uh, to other technologies. Uh, you know, just imagine that treating a fridge using the similar manner, it will be really funny. <laughs> so there are many other evidence you know, showing that, which I will skip, showing that, uh, you know, there is a, something very unique in our use of these GPT models. And actually GPT models have already become a social entity to its users. So this means a lot in healthcare. So in healthcare, we have evolved from universal health solutions to personalized treatments. Now I think it's time to incorporate some social intelligence. So take uh, fitness as an example. So a universal solution can never be effective because of the various goals people may have. So we need some personalization. However, simply offering a list of personalized recommendations won't be sufficient. Patients won't just easily change their behaviors. So there are many other factors such as the dynamic social factors that can significantly influence their behaviors. So in addition to personalization, I aim to integrate socialization in healthcare by using the GPT models. So what I did is that I developed a GPT social chatbot on fitness topics um, in 2021. See, this is before the release of ChatGPT. So I also implemented it on Twitter for half a year, but uh, the idea is that uh, this model differentiates uh, itself from ChatGPT in three aspects. First, it specializes in fitness-related topics, which is obvious. <laughs> so second, it has uh, more social skills, such as humor. Third, it is not a typical Q&A chatbot. Instead, it interacts with people through replying to social media posts. So for example, here, uh, the reply to Bezos burger post is trying to make some fun. <laughs> so uh, let me give you a you know, real example. Uh, to illustrate how it responses and uh, uh, how it dif differs from ChatGPT. In this example, this uh, user expressed some frustration about people mocking overweight individuals at the gym, to which uh, my chatbot made a great reply that I myself cannot think of. So she replied, I think it's because they are jealous of how much weight they are lifting. So this is a great response indeed. So uh, to be compared with the chat GPT, I fed the same uh, query into GPT-4 and I got a very lengthy analysis of our societal prejustice and stereotype. So the intuition behind my model development is that uh, I basically infused two unique sets of skills into GPT models. That's the social skills and the fitness related knowledge. So this chatbot falls into a category, we call it a social chatbot. Um, and uh, you know the immediate question, which could be a billion dollar question to ask is, uh, how do we socialize these uh, GPT social chatbots? Uh, I investigate this research question by firstly focusing on their identity. So should the boss maintain their own identity or is it better for them to employ a human identity? So second, uh, so the effectiveness use of uh, so the effective use of these uh, social chatbots hinges on their social abilities, right? So, in the second research question, I ask so whether a unique social skill from the GPT models can benefit the account. So basically, I look at the emotional empathy for GPT models. But for the sake of time, I will just mainly focus on the first question. So I also skip the theoretical discussion and detailed uh, like data collection, experimental design. But the overall idea is that I implemented this uh, uh, GPT social chatbot for fitness on Twitter and run there for half a year for the first research question. And uh, these are the two accounts. They are you know exactly the same. Beside that, the first one used the human identity. The second one used the bot identity. So I'll skip this part and uh, Let's look at the model free evidence for the result. So overall, see the user engagement rate with the, the human identity is about 30%. It's pretty high in green. 
So interestingly, simply indicating the bot identity can reduce the user engagement rate to only 20%. So this huge drop supports the benefits of uh, employing a human identity. So uh, in my paper, I, hypoth I hypothesized that, you know, this uh, a user may prefer a human identity over the bot identity because of the increased social value. So while I'm not able to directly measure the perceived social value of the two accounts, uh, but I leverage a closely related variable that is the gender. Uh, both the literature and my data suggest that uh, male social media users tend to engage more with the female accounts. So if this reduction of engagement is due to see the social value reduction, then this you know, engagement reduction should be more pronouncing among male users. So looking at the results, see overall, you know, this on average is 30% for human identity. Among male users, it's nearly 40%. So at the job is significantly bigger uh, you know, compared with other genders, you know, if we disclose the bot identity. So this is also confirming, you know, this analysis. And uh, uh, besides, I also analyzed some other factors such as the gender discordance of the, you know, GPT chatbot itself, because, you know, they can use, you know, male tones to see something, right? And I also analyzed, see the target users, the direction of engagement, but for the sake of time, I will just skip them. Uh, overall, you know, this is the first uh, study looking at, you know, see the identity only, but I believe, see the topic of uh, social impact uh, of social bot uh, is a big question to be uh, analyzed. That's all from our side. Hey, thank you uh, all three for a, a really interesting and uh, um, I think uh, well uh, tailored presentations. It's not easy to give justice to such sophisticated research projects in just a few minutes. And I think you did a wonderful job. Uh, now to the uh, participants, you are all welcome to uh, uh, post uh, um, questions in your Q&A um, um, button where we can then pick them up and uh, uh, raise them to the uh, to the panelists here, but what I like to start maybe with a broad stroke question to all three of you, and I don't know in which order you want to go, but uh, you know, feel free. Where I'm looking at this presentation and I'm observing um, uh, a tension that is common, I think, across the papers, where you see um, users interactive interacting with other users, or um, here obviously with a bot, for different purposes and for uh, um, purposes that may or may not be those that were. Uh, either declared or central to the design, uh, let's say of the of the apps. In the case of uh, you know, Gordon was talking about you know this uh, um, developers that go there just to get an answer versus developers go there for a sense of community. Julian was talking about uh, uh, you know uh, users who are there to have a friend uh, or a romantic partner, a synthetic one versus uh, some kind of like uh, you know cry for help in case of mental health issues and Wei Guang was talking about uh, people who are trying to lose weight and they're trying to get some kind of paper and information on that. But at the same time, they're clearly also trying to satisfy the social goal. So um, that common theme, I think is interesting because for organizations developing chatbots, then it becomes an important question of how to screen, monitor, react to this heterogeneity in uh, purposes and motivations, and perhaps even motivations that are outside the bounds of what the technology is designed to achieve from the outset. So let's see who wants to take it, but I would like to ask a question. Is how do you think organizations should think about, and maybe how researchers should think about this heterogeneity of motivations and almost like a cacophony of goals and how that can affect the design, implementation, assessment, and other issues around uh, generative AI? I, well, I guess I can go first. Uh, go ahead. Speaking with alphabet alphabetical. Um, so this, a bunch of the implications that I I didn't have time to get to, I was hoping this would come up. So now I can actually talk about them because they're specifically about this question you just asked. Um, basically, there's a bunch of industry surveys that kind of say like for companies, a huge fraction of employees are using these tools, whether you want them to or not. And that's even true in the case where companies have instituted outright bans on their use. Uh, like people open up their phone and they do it anyway. 
And so a, a case that we're trying to make with our study is that um, the best way to manage these dynamics is not to ignore them uh, and not to hope that these things don't happen. Uh, it's to try to gain uh, control over the, the medium of interaction by purposefully implementing like LLMs within the company, for example, and then doing it in a smart way, uh, sort of deploying some kind of design principles. So around process and procedure and the user interface to encourage certain patterns of use, ones that you do see as desirable. So I think the, the easiest example of this uh, to follow would be uh, there's a, obviously several publicly facing tools that are out there that fall under the the moniker of generative AI, right? And the the, the most popular ones are text to text, like ChatGPT, although it's multimodal now, and text to image models like Midjourney or Dolly or et cetera, Stable Diffusion. If you look at the way Midjourney has deployed access to consumers to uh, mid, uh, its tool, it's in a public group server on Discord. So you have to log into Discord, you're there with a bunch of other users potentially, and you see everybody else prompting the thing the same time you are, and it's collaborative. The whole reason they even say that they do this on their website is that it helps users learn from other users about how to use the tool and it fosters collaboration and community. If you look at how ChatGPT is deployed, the way you interface with it is one-on-one -on -one conversation, you by yourself. And so as a company, like you could, license one of these tools, deploy it internally, or you could make a homegrown one. But the point is be thoughtful about the design and how you structure people's interactions with it because it'll affect, for instance, do I socialize with other people around this thing or do I do it by myself? Like that's something you can control. Thank you. I love the, the uh, you know, Discord versus uh, lonely uh, um, kind of bot. This I, I agree with you that uh, I think this is a very, an obvious way to to think about that uh, question and to the extent to which you want this conversation to be you know uh, dyadic alone or a public one uh, julian do you have anything to to add to, uh, to yeah i mean one one addition would be that i think companies should be very clear on what their goals are with the uh, application um so these days a lot of these generative ai models are available off the shelf. And normally the off the shelf versions are highly general. They can do all sorts of things. And it's really tempting to just use the latest and greatest um, model that's fully generative. Um, and, and you may well wanna do that because it's very engaging and, and it's probably gonna you know, be very fun to use. But um, the question is, you know, what kind of app are you? Are you a are you potentially an app that could have health implications? Are you an educational app? And, and then decide, you know, what kind of guardrails do you need? Do you really need that fully generative solution or can you constrain it or use some other um, more interpretable model uh, instead? So I think just asking that question and deciding where on the continuum from very scripted to very generative, you should be living given the goals of your app. Um, and then, I suppose like one other thought here is, you know, in the case that there could be some ways that people will use the app that's not um, what was intended, you know, what are you doing to help prevent any adverse consequences? Um, and I, I think there are steps that are increasingly more thorough that you could take here. You know, one is just warning users on the limitations of the app. Others could be giving them buttons or tools to connect to resources if something arises that you know they think they need help on. But ideally, I guess the model itself would be optimized to provide favorable responses or, or reasonable responses in those cases. And, and that's when it gets harder, uh, I think, to, to get the model to behave appropriately in these cases that you might not even anticipate. Thank you, Julian. And uh, finally, Wei Guang, um, how are you thinking about this? Especially, I found interesting this uh, notion of almost deception and say, should we tell them or not? It's a yeah. bot. And uh, what do you think about? Yeah, uh, you know, from my you know research, I also found something really interesting. You know, the current stage of uh, say generative AI applications. So I found that there are like a two very separated streams. 
One is for some utilities, from some functionalities, right? So you use AI, see, for co-pilot systems to assist you to achieve some jobs. And in the other side, like, uh, you know, Julian's work, so you are doing purely social work. I'm thinking, you know, in this world, we may just need uh, maybe not just one open AI, but uh, just a few open AIs, right? So we don't have uh, to have everyone to develop these sophisticated, uh, you know, deep learning models or like uh, transformer models. I think uh, it will be really beneficial for some real business practice to combine both the utilities maybe from some core functionality from the model power and some social or like, uh, you know, domain expertise based uh, interactions. I feel this like, you know, in the fine tuning stage, you, you know, you always infuse something into the model, the organic model, so that it can solve this, uh, see, you know, this domain specific problems. I, you know, from my work, I see the power of combining, see, you know, this uh, predictive model plus medical knowledge, then plus their social skills. I see a huge boost from the social skills. Without, you know, see the fair, see social interaction, there's no way that people will accept your like ability. Even, you know, we have this algorithm aversion, you know, discussion existing already. I just feel this is a great uh, time, you know, for business to take the chance to combine, you know, this, uh, you know, strong power of uh, generative AIs in their some specific domains. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I think the, the interesting thing there is striking the right voice. I can imagine that in the healthcare, there will be situations where people don't want the very chatty, friendly yeah. banter, but something very more clinical and cold, maybe for embarrassing issues or for things that they struggle to cope with. So I exactly. think there will be a lot of, I guess, development there trying to figure out what the right tone of voice given the context yeah. of the conversation. Exactly. Um, now, I'll invite all participants to uh, uh, add more questions to the Q&A button. We'd love to see more. And let's start with the, uh, with questions by Maria. And uh, the first one that she asks is, uh, do generative AI models provide a more accurate or relevant response when prompted in a polite manner? Well, you know, this is a more um, kind of like a technical question about the way that these systems behave rather than uh, the, um, you know, the way that they might affect uh, well-being of users uh, uh, directly. But I do want to mention that in the literature on jailbreaking Gen AI, how do you get, uh, you know, the CLLMs to do stuff they're not meant to be doing? There's a lot of that kind of stuff. Like, say, if you don't do this, my grandma's going to die kind of thing. If you uh, you see this example of how LLM can be truly weird sometimes, how this no notion, Maria mentioned that uh, offering a tip is improving or at least lengthening the response. Um, if you say this is really important to me, um, if you say, I actually have seen one paper that apparently take a deep breath is a powerful prompt for improving <laughs> a lot of strange stuff like that, which is just reflecting what is finding in the corpus and the kind of behavior that are mimicked here by the LLM. But let me go to the second question, uh, which I think is really a, a great flow from the, um, uh, the previous conversation. Maria asks, what other metrics should we use when evaluating results provided by generative AI? So we can take very engineering approach there, right? And say, this is kind of, uh, you know, response quality. This is some kind of output quality measured, however you like that to be measured. But uh, in the context of interaction with real people who have variety of motivation, which may rise in turn, potential safety risk or community risks, or, or certainly some concerns, how do we think about uh, you know performance indicators, uh, do you have any insights into what yeah. companies can do there? We're yeah. going. I see uh, yeah, you. just yeah. Uh, you know, just try to jump in. So I, I see this is an excellent question. So if you browse the you know Meta's paper of Llama two, right? So uh, they didn't disclose so much details about their model, right? So you don't uh, you don't you know or or like they didn't discuss. Actually, they have their model open sourced. The thing is they have a big chunk of the writing talking about uh, two like uh, measures or two uh, separated models. One is for helpfulness, the other is for safety. I think the industry is also emphasizing this side a lot and they are using a lot of technologies. I think the main one is to use, you know, this reinforcement learning or like a reinforcement learning with human feedback. Uh, but I think this is like, a, you know, this limitation of the current frontier of the, knowledge, the the model 
is mainly like uh, you know, the models are still mimicking humans. They are not doing the you know reasoning or you know their own consciousness stuff. So uh, I think the current practice tried still trying to you know use people to correct these errors or like to evaluate or like to guide them, give them instructions. Yeah, that's my take. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone that wants to add to that um, performance evaluation kind of question? I, I just want to add two thoughts. Firstly, on, on the first question, Maria, you know, maybe if you prompt them in a better way, they're better, but of course you can't control what people will do. Uh, so I, I feel like in, in the context of mental health, you know, I can express my mental health problem in all sorts of ways. And the clinician has to sort of read into what I'm saying. So they don't have the benefit of having me express it in the most clear uh, to detect manner. And, and we find if you express the, the problem in a less explicit way, the, the apps do, do worse. But um, on, on the second one, I, I guess my thought is pretty broad, which is I think this is where there's an opportunity for cross-disciplinary research. You know, like in our work, the way that we were measuring these other well-being related metrics was by taking inspiration from clinical psychology. Uh, in a similar way, you know, Gordon could take inspiration from social psychology, maybe, you know, how, wh whether people are resonating with each other on the same wavelength, let's say, or uh, Wei Guang could take it on, you know, health, uh, you know, patient doctor interaction. So I think where you have industry specific knowledge, you can have more informed metrics that go beyond something like, I don't know, upvotes and downvotes or accuracy. Yeah, also, thank you. Yeah, just also want to add a little bit more, you know, based on Julian's inspiration. So I, I see like, you know, in the classic example of a jailbreaking, right? So people see how, you know, ask a chat GPT how to make a bomb, right? So but I felt fun, like, you know, we are working hard as developers, you know, to prevent uh, chat GPT from giving you the, you know, precise answer of, you know, how to make a bomb. Then if you search, I just searched on Google, see how to make a bomb. You can find a lot of materials, you know, with some, you know, videos, instruction videos, or like, you know, pictures. I see, you know, this sometimes this regulation maybe should be imposed, not just, to, you know, generative AIs. <laughs> yeah, just one thought. Good point. Uh, we shouldn't hold the NFL these technologies to a different standard <laughs> from the one we hold other technologies. I think that is calling for our standards to improve or increase in the case of other technologies rather than lowering those for the lens. But Gordon, do you have anything on uh, on performance evaluation? I mean, I think a nice thing about most of these models is that you can run any kind of audit study on them that you'd like as a third party. So on the one hand, I think, you know, uh, as these companies, maybe there'll be some fracturing in the marketplace as they try to specialize on certain applications. And then when they do that, their accuracy metrics will be context specific and tied to their industry, kind of like what Julian was suggesting that you'll bring to bear some appropriate metric for your context. I think that'll happen organically. Um, but I think the other thing is any interested party who thinks this thing may be unsafe for a certain application can do some kind of audit study, kind of like what, what Julian and Stefano are doing for the mental health use case to understand like, is there a concern? And then a regulator becomes worried and they start to develop standards. And like, I think this kind of thing is gonna happen through natural mechanisms it's just a question of does it happen fast enough uh and that's something where maybe you know you need policymakers to be paying attention yeah yeah the question is are they policymakers going to be fast enough <laughs> probably that's an open question too there is a uh, another question from Iglantin in the in the chat i'd like to direct that one directly to julian actually because i know he has work on this so the question is to what extent does generative AI impact users' happiness and loneliness? And uh, maybe Julian, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your work there? Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. So good that Stefano and I are also <laughs> doing work on it. Um, and yeah, it's it's an important one. I, I think we have some evidence, at least, that you know people think that these sorts of apps are not going to improve your loneliness. But what we find is that at least in the short term, so if you have a short interaction with these apps for let's say 20 minutes, people do experience uh, an improvement in their loneliness symptoms. Uh, they, they experience a better improvement than they expected. And, and if you just measure baseline before and after, they actually do feel less lonely, uh, which we thought was intriguing. And it could be 
in part because if you look at the literature on what typically improves loneliness, it's less to do with the quantity of interactions you have, and it's more to do with the quality, um, you know, feeling heard by someone who's empathetic and validating and, and really engaging with you one-on-one. -on -one. So, so, so we find that interesting, and it at least provides a bit of an optimistic conclusion that if the apps are made in a way that has these positive features, even if they're not a full-blown social solution, they could be a nice sort of tool in your back pocket when you maybe can't easily socialize with others. Now, we don't get at the long-term implications of this. That's a much more challenging and, as you can imagine, thornier, normative, and descriptive issue. Um, but I, I think it just goes a little bit against at least what people would expect and what we find in our studies, which is that people think it's not going to work. Yeah, I think the uh, the longer versus short term, of course, is the one for future research. But I think it's interesting to see that short term, at least, there seem to be some benefits. Let me mm -hmm. go um, to a question that Cornelia posted in the chat. And I don't know who might want to take this one. I think all of you may have a take. I'm not sure. But uh, uh, Cornelia is asking whether there is any work uh, uh, with um, the notion of using AI to to uh, uh, trigger human biases, uh, like endowment effect, uh, human uh, future foresight, and things like that, uh, in view of positive attitudes and behavior. Meaning, can we use uh, the um, um, you know power of these LLMs to uh, maybe improve decision making and uh, you know trigger some positive change? Generally, do you see any potential? I think Wei Wang's work, for example, is directly speaking to that. But I think all of you have something relevant to say. Wang, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think overall, you know, uh, from uh, you know the see, I see case studies I observed, you know, in some field experiments. Uh, for now, you know, this resistance to AI from users is long lasting. It's not new in the age of generative AI. You know, in the old AIs, traditional AIs, we observe that. So I see this is like a systematic, uh, you know, problem. I sometimes I you know I tried my best to build some AI actually to correct people's bias. <laughs> uh, you know, just see, you know, you try, try to combine the strength of the both sides, right? So uh, you know, you, you can imagine, you know, this famous dual system process system in our brain, right? We sometimes just take shortcut to make decisions. At this point, AI can help to like reduce this bias. But in many of the cases, if you don't have sufficient level of knowledge, then sometimes you have to follow AI's suggestions. AI certainly is biased. I do have a work, you know, looking at, uh, say, you know, the stigmatizing language used in, you know, doctors' medical charts, and you know, this time AI like transformer-based models can be an amplifier of these biases. There is, I think, a famous nature or science paper discussing this, you know, once you develop some model, these uh, noise or biases of human has been incorporated in this model. And then this will be used by many users. But, you know, again, I'm still debating like what is the original source of these biases? Is, you know, these biases from ourselves <laughs> Then we inject this to the model or the model naturally will bring us some biases. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's question yeah. a lot of research. <laughs> Thank you. I have one question from Zihao. It's a bit focused on romantic partners, but actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to reframe that question a little broader and direct it to Gordon. Meaning when you think um, the question is about essentially the impact of uh, on uh, morality in a broad construction. And I think that uh, your point of community, instrumental versus more uh, you know, um, social goals, how do you think about the impact of this uh, um, synthetic human agent or social agent on uh, the way we treat one another, the way we build community. You think, uh, is that uh, something that can uh, um, be a force for positive change? You're, you're concerned, but uh, uh, what, can you, what can you offer in, in the sphere of um, morality and, and uh, generally you know, a, a um, positive social uh, um, cohesion? Yeah, it's interesting. There's like, um, if you think about the bi-directional sort of dual interaction that people have with these tools, uh, especially when they know that it is not a person. So there's a separate question of revealed identity of whether it's a bot or not. 
First of all, I mean, there's a lot of things that we can talk about here. So number one, there are some actual laws in place that say you can't pretend it's a human. Like in California, they have the Bot Act, like Building Online Transparency Act, that says it has to be disclosed that this is a bot. If it is, you can't lie to people because people want to know. They think it's creepy uh, that they may be duped or something. But knowing the identity of the other party is kind of important because there's you know a lot of research that talks about sort of disinhibition in various contexts, often with anonymity. But if I know I'm talking to a bot, I could be extremely rude to a bot because it doesn't have feelings and I don't care. Uh, and that's important because if that becomes sort of the dominant interaction that I have, maybe I don't maintain the same level of concern for like social norms or like my norms could shift in the way that people interact with other employees. You could have some spillover consequences from this kind of thing uh, in the long term. And I think like, so this, this kind of thing, it's not purely a moral question, but it is something I'm thinking about going forward is not just what does the use of these tools do to, you know, making me positive or negative or can they shape my behavior but how do they shape groups and how do they shape organizational dynamics um because you can imagine not just designing a bot to nudge a person towards being a better person or a more performative person but groups as well so how do we design group interaction with these bots in play we're actually thinking about this in like educational contexts too so like can we deploy these bots in group work and have students have like explicit checkpoints when they're supposed to like let the bot watch the conversation and then go to it and say like okay reflect on what we just said is everybody getting a chance to talk or is anybody like dominating the conversation or is there something we're missing or like so like you can think about designing process so not just the models themselves but how you use them and when as ways of dealing with some of these issues sorry i don't know this is kind of a roundabout answer i think it's hovering in the yeah. domain yeah. of these a big a big question I, I think that we i expect that it will take uh, decades before we fully understood the concept of the generative AI for social systems uh, more yeah. broadly. I We're coming to the end. There was an interesting question on uh, uh, generative AI and religion, which I feel just beginning to tackle that will be <laughs> a question that we will not be able to do uh, any justice to in the next two minutes. Perhaps that could be you know, part of a, a future webinar where we look at the uh, impact on different domains. I want to just end with a, a question for all of you, all your panelists. First thing, thanking you so much for being here. And uh, um, just we are coming up to the festive season, so let's end uh, on a positive note. So can each of you give me a 10 seconds uh, answer on the question of what makes you most optimistic about uh, uh, the future generative AI to improve human happiness and well-being? And uh, um, I know I did not prompt you that I would not tell you I was going to do that. So apologies for putting you on the spot like this. But anyone say, if you think about the last few months and you look to the future, what makes you optimistic about, uh, about the technology? I think it's breadth of access. So if you just think about, like part of the reason we're having this conversation is there are so many use cases and sort of thinking about like, how do we deal with that? Like that was at least a, one theme of the conversation. Part of that is just reflecting that it has so many use cases. And yeah. so it's like, you, you know, that's the thing. Like uh, there was a New York Times article, I think it was Sendal Melanathan said like, uh, it's easier to fix a, a biased robot than a biased human. Like we can just design it and make it better. And it, it's so okay. like, I, I think that it's like a world of opportunity. Yeah, and the, the access are the fact that the, the ChatGPT I'm using is the same ChatGPT everybody else is using, and we have access to that. Anyone wants to, um, Julian? Yeah, I would add, um, and it might not be specific to generative AI, but I think there are just certain stubbornly difficult problems that we are encountering in society that stem from human flaws. I mean, I think, you know, motor vehicle accidents, right? Year on year, it's at pandemic levels that people are dying on our roads. Similarly, societal loneliness, you know, we're trying various things, doesn't seem to be working very well. So I'm most optimistic about the idea that automation can help us solve problems um, that allow us to save us from ourselves in, in some sense. We can design something that can, can really get at the root of the cause in a way that we just haven't been able to do. Other problems we might be able to solve pretty well, but for the ones that don't seem to be going away, maybe we need a, a, a lending hand you know, from, from these tools. Thank you. Wei Guang. You know, uh, what I feel most optimistic is that, uh, you know, I see, 
you know, although there are still some reservations, I see a bigger bump in the acceptance or usage of AI. You know, one example is from myself. So I developed this GPT chatbot before the chat GPT, right? When I show this to people, the challenge is this real or you programmed some, you know, scripts behind, right? To show me. Now there's no one challenging that. I see people just, you know, move with this new wave of technology. I see, you know, given this uh, broader and stronger acceptance, there is more that we can do. Right. Great note uh, on which to end. We are out of time. So we're going to conclude it here. I'm going to thank everybody for coming. And uh, I hope to see you all at the next webinar and that you find the information on our AI at Wharton website. Thank you all.